Now, what would you think if I told you that regenerative agriculture can both save the planet and renew human health at the same time? Preposterous? This guy's off his rocker? Last time I checked, no. And so I'd like to take you on the journey that led to that conclusion. And that journey began here on my farm in Snowy Mountains region. Beautiful native grasslands, lots of biodiversity. Including these guys, who only arrived, yellow robins, after the big fires in the mountains in 2003. Now they're in abundance, so they clearly like the biodiversity there. As do these guys, black cockatoos, who also arrived after the fires and are now there, and painted here by my friend Richard Weatherly. And Richard has captured their lazy flights in that painting. So it might surprise you to know that early in my farming career, I did great damage to this beautiful landscape and therefore some of its creatures. But that in turn became a catalyst for change. But first, what is regenerative agriculture? Well, it's an ecological approach of farming that enables landscapes to renew themselves. Radical idea, that. Enabling and not dominating. There's a range of practices in regenerative agriculture. Ecological or holistic grazing. Cropping with biological inputs. Cropping into native grasslands agroforestry, food forestry, and a range of others like biodynamics and permaculture. There's now tens of millions of hectares worldwide under this approach, and generally run by family and not corporate farms. In contrast, industrial agriculture tends to simplify, dominate, control, and usually ends up destroying natural systems in their cycles. And it's driven by some of the world's biggest multinationals, chemical and pharmaceutical companies, operating under an economic rationalist philosophy of growth and greed. Now, some of its key practices are monocultural cropping, the application of synthetic fertilizers, weedicides, pesticides, pharmaceuticals the manipulation of plants and animal genomes, and the factory farming of animals. Now, all of these are unnatural, some unconscionable. So, how come a nature lover ended up adopting some of these practices? Well, I grew up as an only child on our farm, and spent a lot of time up in the bush nearby National Park, so I was a nature lover. Ended up over here at ANU doing zoology. But at the age of 22, my father's illness meant I went home to take over management. Problem was, I knew nothing about management. So I sourced the best advice, best local farmers, Department of Agriculture, CSRO, read lots of books and papers. And the result of that was that I was inducted into the industrial paradigm or worldview of agriculture. And consequently, early in my farming career, I ended up doing damage. I remember overgrazing and ploughing beautiful native grasslands. And I particularly remember the big drought of the early 1980s, where I arrogantly said, I'm going to fight this. So I kept my animals, bought in lots of feed, and the result, you can see, we damaged the landscape, we ended up with a big debt. But that began to rattle the cage. And change came from a number of incidents. I remember a few years ago, 
one Saturday morning, driving to our local town half an hour away with my son-in-law Andrew and grandson Hamish to watch Hamish play soccer. On the way, we passed a farmer spraying his paddock with herbicide. And, and suddenly, seven-year-old Hamish said to me, Grandpa, why do we have to kill things to grow things? It was a profound question, and it really got me thinking. And then on my subsequent travels across Australia, I encountered more and more regenerative farmers. And I discovered they weren't just re regenerating their landscapes, but also their finances and family and mental health. So the upshot was, in my late 50s, I ended up back at ANU doing a PhD, asking the question, why had they shifted and what were they doing? And then the breakthrough came, because I was forced to reflect on my own early journey, and I realised I'd actually been landscape illiterate. I couldn't read the landscape. I didn't know how it was functioning. I didn't realise that landscape should have been in hospital in intensive care. It needed healing. So, consequently, as, as a in my teaching students and then writing a book about this subject, I came up with a model to teach ecological literacy. Now, there are lots of cycles in nature, chemical and otherwise, but you could simplify them down to those five key functions. Obviously, the solar drives it all. There's a water cycle, soil, mineral, biodiversity. And the one we all forget about, this one, uh, the worldviews and paradigms we bring to our landscape. If you look at the diagram, all those interconnecting arrows, if you damage one of those systems, you damage them all because of that connection. But if you regenerate them, you regenerate them all. And it's that process that drives a healthy planet and healthy humans. So let me just give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> we all know the solar energy is key, the solar cycle is key. So plants have many solar panels, they photosynthesize, grab carbon dioxide, turn it into sugars, which feeds all that soil biology, if it's healthy soil. And then that biology brings in nutrients for the plants, and we, we eat the plants. But that biology and plants also lays down, through that process, long-lived carbon. And our entire industrial civilization is based on fossil fuels through that process. Now, this guy I visited, Norman Croon, in tough country in South Africa. The left side of that fence line is his farm today. On the right is a neighbour still farming desert. Now, when Norman started a few decades ago, it was all desert, 400 years of European mismanagement. He then set about ecological grazing, putting on his solar panels and diverse plants, and that kick-started the carbon and the soil cycle and the water cycle and then biodiversity, and you can see the result today. And today, compared to when he started a few decades ago, he's now, with his animals and production, producing more than three times what he started with. Biodiversity, another example. <clears throat> a few years ago, I visited some friends just out of Canberra who told me they were regenerating their creek with various methods. And as we drove to have a look, we passed the neighbour who was traditional industrial farming, so it was overgrazed, it was bare, there were signs of dry land salt, the creek was dry, and there was recent erosion from a rain event. But then downstream through the fence, I came across David and Jane's creek, and there was hundreds of metres of green, lush grass coming out from their creek, lush vegetation. And because of the water stored in ground, that creek now was running all year round. And while we're there talking about this, I noticed a patch of tall Phragmites reeds. And suddenly, out of those reeds came this beautiful call of a reed warbler, that guy, no bigger than a wine glass. And it suddenly hit me. That was probably the first time in 150 years of European mismanagement that a reed warbler had returned to that valley. And all because that family had begun to love and care for their land. 
So, <clears throat> so what? How does this relate to our planet? Well, it relates because what we do in our landscapes extrapolates right across to the planet. And there she is. It's a one-off. There's only one blue-green planet where life itself created conditions for life. And that maintenance of those conditions means that today we have nine integrated self-organising systems maintaining those conditions, climate being one of them. Problem is, our industrial society has now started, as we heard earlier today, grossly destabilise all those systems. Due to our, uh, our fossil fuels and all the rest of it, and that's why there's an increasing consensus of scientists saying Earth has now moved into a new epoch, which they're calling the Anthropocene, anthropo-human-made. And if you look at those systems up there, the red and the yellow shows that some of those systems are getting into highly dangerous states, possible runaway events. And the key point I want to make, if you look at all the research is that the practices of industrial agriculture are a key player in destabilising and dangerously most of those systems. But there's a flip side to that, because if we turn that around, regenerative agriculture can play a, a huge role. So you, going back to Norman Croon's farm, on the right, ongoing degradation, carbon dioxide up, continuing degradation of the other cycles, on the left, the opposite. And that extrapolates across huge landscapes. And we're starting to get some numbers on this. Recently, one of the world's leading environmental and social change agents over the last few decades, Paul Hawken, has initiated a study, 70 or more scientists and analysts crunching the numbers on the 100 best methods of drawing carbon dioxide, burying it away or avoiding it going up. And I looked at and all this, there's a few regenerative agriculture approaches in there, all doing the same thing. So I aggregated them together and called it regenerative agriculture. And by nearly two and a half times, the next best method, regenerative agriculture is the best way of pulling carbon down and burying it in the soil. And so that's why I say with great confidence, regenerative agriculture can heal and save the planet. But this, in turn, is connected to our modern health crisis, mental and, and biophysical. Because with the rise of the Anthropocene has come a parallel rise of human ill health, through various reasons. The way industrial society processes its food, adds fats, sugars, salts, and generally destroys all the micro, a lot of the micronutrients and main nutrients that we've co-evolved for for our health and immune systems over millions of years. But a key destabiliser of those nutrients and health is industrial agriculture, the way we plough, etc. And here's a cross-section of the crucial element of soil biology. It just shows one of the key players, which is the root fungus, microhousal micro fungi. So they feed off the plant sugars, go and source the nutrients, which feeds the whole process. But if we plough, fertilise, spray poisons, pesticides, weedicides, we kill off most of that soil biology. So all that huge range of micronutrients aren't coming back in, and we're left with drug addict plants waiting for their industrial fix of just a few restricted nutrients. And the evidence is showing there's a high correlation between that process and, and the rise of industrial diseases post-Second World War. But there's even another dangerous element in this, and it's coming at us like an express train. And that is the widespread use of the world's most used herbicide, known as glyphosate, and a brand name you'd be familiar with, Roundup. And because it's water-soluble, we now know it's widely pervasive in our environment. There's nearly a million tonnes going out every year of this stuff. Isn't it? So it's in our groundwater, our surface water, it's in our industrial foods. The tests are showing now it's in most of our bodies. It's even in breast milk. And when it gets into our body, research is confirming it is now having a devastating impact. It gets into this critical microbiome of our gut. It's destabilising 
a crucial amino acid pathway essential for our immune function. Being water soluble, it's crossing some of the critical barriers in our body, stop toxins getting in. It's crossing the gut lining, the blood brain barrier, etc. And again, the research is showing a huge escalation, particularly from the 1990s, of the use of glyphosate is highly correlated with a lot of the modern mental and biophysical diseases. Okay. Let's sweep the negative aside, because we now have regenerative biological replacements and methods for farming, and biological replacements for the inputs in that farming, and we can turn it around. And I can now go back to my grandson, who asked that profound question: "Grandpa, why do we have to kill things to grow things?" And I could say to him, Hamish, we don't have to kill things; we just have to nourish them. And so that seven-year-old boy at Reed Warbler, and indeed the planet, they're calling us all. They're calling us to nurture and care for this earth, because I can tell you, the solutions aren't going to come from the big end of town. They're not going to come from government. It's up to us. And so they're calling us to do three things: one, for we farmers to shift to regenerative agriculture; two, for all of us to grow and consume healthy food and nourish our communities; and three, for all of us to begin really loving and nurturing that one-off blue-green planet. And so that's why I can say to you with the utmost conviction. That regenerative agriculture can save both the planet and renew human health at the same time. <clears throat> <clears throat>